I don't know what your experience has been with Song of Solomon. Years ago, I read the book, and I thought, wow, there's a lot of things I don't understand about this one. How come it's here? And so I did what I think we should all do when we come to difficult passages and say, when I have more understanding of the rest of the Bible, this will make more sense, right? And uh, that way we keep out of a lot of trouble. So this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to do part three of Song of Solomon. I've done the first two parts here, but I'm going to do a little review first. Because the first parts of Song of Solomon have to be there in order to understand the rest of it. So the scene opens. As we mentioned before, it's like Revelation. There's a scene. Curtain goes up. And you see it, and then the curtain goes down, and then you're ready for another scene. It's not like a storybook. You start from start to finish and have a story. You can't read it that way. It doesn't make much sense. But when you look at it in the way we've just described, it makes a whole lot of sense. Scene one opens with a young woman in a vineyard run by her family, and she feels like she's been sort of picked on to be out there in the hot sun all day picking, ho hoeing weeds or pulling weeds and training vines and all those kind of things. Her skin is darkened by the exposure to the sun every day and she's very, very bored and she, she feels like her family has put her out there and she just feels bad for herself. Ever feel sorry for yourself? Yeah, we all have. Then one day, a shepherd boy comes along with some shepherds, with some sheep. And he, uh, he grazes his sheep outside the vineyard. And one day, he comes over to the rock fence and he says hello. And uh, he's a handsome young man. And she goes over to the fence and they begin conversations. And every day he comes back. And her heart just thrills to go to the vineyard because why? The shepherd boy shows up one day. The shepherd didn't show up. And she's crushed. She's heartbroken. So she leaves the vineyard and she goes down to the, where the tents are, where the shepherds have their flocks. And she, she talks to them. And they've been cued. They know what's going on. And so they tell her to go down to the city. And uh, when she goes down to the city, there are people that are queued there also. And they usher her in to the palace of the king. The banquet's been set. And uh, <clears throat> by and by, she realizes that the shepherd boy was none other than King Solomon. And she is enamored with the scene around her. Uh, the banner over me is love. And it's the springtime of the year. And uh, she's, uh, she's so happy, so happy. Ultimately, she becomes the wife, the queen of Israel. Solomon's wife. And uh, as the marriage sort of uh, settles down, She's in bed one night, and she uh, in the, early in the morning, somebody raps at the window, and it's her, it's her husband, King Solomon. And he says, come away with me. Let's go for a little, a little trip. And she says, oh, I'm so tired. Could we do it on another day? You know, it's so easy to love Jesus isn't it? It's also so easy to become complacent in Christianity, right? Anybody have that experience? Very easy thing to do, to slip away. Well, you know, when we lose Jesus for a little while, a day or two, it might take us three days to find him again, just like it did there in the, at the temple when the, Joseph and Mary lost him for for a little while, it took him three days to find him. Not a good thing. 
The day finally comes when they decide to go visit the in-laws. The people who owned the vineyard where she first worked. And as uh, they go, they're carried on a wheelless carriage that's supported by 60 soldiers, men of war, okay? And in the distance of the little village where they're going, the people see a cloud of dust coming. You know, that chariot is really, really royal. It has gold in it. It's very, very heavy. And here she is, the bride of the king, going to visit the in-laws. And what a wonderful reunion they have as they see hometown girl making good, right? She's the queen now. She's no longer the little girl out there in the vineyard <clears throat> doing the bidding of her family. That brings us up to our, to our third part. I want to finish Solomon's love story today. It's a wonderful story that depicts God's love for his church. This is the, the central point of this idea. We possess in the Father's eyes the glimpse of approval that the Father has for Jesus. We don't need to worry about what God thinks of us, but what he thinks about Jesus, who is our substitute, right? He looks at us as his own sons and daughters. He looks at us and says, this is my beloved son in whom I are daughter in whom I am well pleased. That's what he thinks of you. Now let's look at a passage in Song of Solomon, chapter four, a little book right after Ecclesiastes, written by King Solomon himself. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter four, verse seven. You are all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. In chapter 6, verses 2 to 4, it says, My beloved has gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, to gather the lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds on the lilies. Oh, you are beautiful, O oh my love, as Tisra, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. <clears throat> as a way with words, right? So what is the basis for living? We can live life in the presence of our failures, and many people do that. Living life in the presence of your failures and engaging in endless sorrow and fretting about this thing and about that thing, right? People do that? I know a ton of people that do that. That's how they live. Or we can live our lives in the presence of success. If God has accepted us, that's the premise upon which I must build my life. That's the premise upon which the Christian builds his or her life in the successes that we live. God accepts you. Is that true? God accepts you. Uh, accept yourself and live on that premise. We just had our scripture reading this morning. I won't turn to it, but uh, verse 11 of that scripture reading says, reckon it so. If God accepts you, believe it. Reckon it that you have been dead indeed to your sins and that you have a new life in Christ. Believe it. They entered not in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. So often in the Bible, the Philippian jail, jailer, Paul tells him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Those are positive ideas. We should take all the comfort we can out of them. Believe what God says about your salvation and live, live as if you were of royal birth. Romans chapter 8 says you are his sons and daughters. God's sons and daughters. What does that mean? Royal birth, right? Princes and princesses. This is the work of God. What is the work of God? Let's turn to it. I'd like to have you see it. It's John chapter 6 verse 29. 
John chapter 6, verse 29. What is the work of God? John 6, verse 29. Sometimes I, I wonder if there's enough belief among us. And uh, we need to take all the comfort we can out of a text like this. This is not some difficult thing to understand. Verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Wow. I wish I had been there when Solomon shows up with his beautiful bride to the old home place, the in-laws, the old hometown not far away from the vineyard where he first found her. Surprise as they see Solomon the king and their own daughter, sisters and aunts and uncles and townspeople in that little humble town, she is with the king, she's the queen. The curtain draws again, backdrop, and then raises. Maybe the same backdrop, but a different act. Let's look at it. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. A little bit hard to find sometimes, isn't it? After Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. You have it? Say amen. amen. Chapter 8, verse 5 says, Who is this that comes up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? I raise you under, the apple, under an apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. Born under an apple tree. Can you imagine that? There she brought you forth that bore you. Flowery language. Born under an apple tree. But now the queen, leaning on the arm of the king. No less the, than the king of Israel. And Solomon and his wife, after a number of years, are back at the old homestead. Another scene. As she's leaning upon her husband's arms, they pass by the little sister. The great concern develops in her heart. She's back at the old home place again. She's in the home and she sees her little sister and she's sorrowful. <clears throat> Song of Solomon 8 verse 8. You might wonder why I'm reading this. It says, <clears throat> we have a little sister. And she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in, that, in the day when she shall be spoken for? What can we do to help our sister? Her concern now is not on herself, but on who? Somebody else. What can I do with my sister? They come home and one of the first things she's concerned about is her little sister, her well-being, and maybe her future, her ability to maybe have children and so forth, all those kind of things. Concern for other people. Who don't have the blessed hope. Concern for other people who don't have the blessed hope. That's what happens when you really get to know Jesus. When you really get to know him, there develops a heart of concern for the people around us, for extended family, for people in the highways and the byways of the earth. And the question is, what can we do for so-and-so? Have you asked that question to yourself lately? What can I do for so-so-and-so? Have you looked at a person, a neighbor, and said, what can I do for him or her or them? And then you've gone ahead and done it. <clears throat> now Solomon gives her a vineyard of her own. 
he has many vineyards. Perhaps as the years have passed, she longs for her childhood. And um, she has a plethora of memories that go back to the vineyard experience. Perhaps Solomon sees that she needs something to keep her occupied. So he gives her a vineyard. And perhaps she wanted or needed the joy of running a place of her own. So now she has a vineyard. But now there's a difference. Years ago when she worked in the vineyard, in the vineyard she was concerned about her darkened skin from the sun, being hot in the sun, and uh, she worked the vineyard under great duress, right? She was beaten down. Others had rejected her. She was trying hard to please them, pulling weeds and trimming vines. Isn't it funny that we look at people who despise us and we try harder and harder to please them. Anybody have that experience? Isn't it funny that how terrified we are at rejection? Door-to-door -door literature, okay, is a good topic. Jim and I have been in the harness for a while. You answer the door and someone comes down out to the door and slams the door in your face. And you go away feeling bad. What on earth for? He doesn't know you, and you don't know him or her. I'm driving down the road. I use this illustration in several different forms. I don't think you've heard this one yet. I'm driving down the road and pull out in front of somebody, and I'm an awful poor driver. Just ask Coral. <clears throat> and... Uh, <clears throat> The first things on my mind is about the other person. What did you do that for? I pulled out in front of him, but I asked, but I asked the question in my mind. It's going through my mind. What did you do that for? Blaming somebody else. So you get out of the car and say, what do you think you're doing? And he says, I think you're, st and you say, I think you're stupid. And he says to himself, why should I be concerned about what do you think of me? You don't even know me. The man at the door, I don't even know him. Why, I'm, why am I upset because of rejection? It's all about me then, isn't it? <clears throat> why should we worry about, about all these things? Early on, she worked in the vineyard, worrying about what the family thought of her. That's a very immature thing. And now she has her own vineyard. How will she work now? Will her attitude have changed now that she has her own vineyard? She has completely a new attitude about weed pulling and vine dressing. Now it's a joy. It's a profit. She wants to have a profit from the vineyard. She has people working for her, perhaps. She tells one go here, another go there. She wants her husband to benefit. What's the difference now between the old vineyard and the new vineyard? Now she's not working because she's rejected, but because she's accepted. We can't do any meaningful, any meaningful missionary work until we really know that we're accepted and that God loves us. We need to be settled on that. The whole thing is good news now. And the Christian, and Christians do what they do out of the most basic feeling of acceptance by God. <clears throat> That's the motive of the Christian. God loves me and accepts me. Not a matter of if I do this thing or that thing, I won't make it. If I give myself to Jesus, I'm already accepted by him. We're, all of us, I think, believe that we're not, not accepted by Jesus on the basis of what we do, right? We're, based, we're accepted on the basis of belief. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Then, but then through the back door comes the thought. But if I don't do it or do do it, I won't make it. And the devil's working overtime with our minds, playing, playing tricks on our minds. The victorious Christian doesn't think that way. 
I can't live that way. <coughs> Beaten down like the woman in the vineyard, like the young woman in the vineyard. It's the but that is the poison that spoils the pot. But the Christian that is saved by grace is a new what? Say it loud. A new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And the thing, and we do things now from a new motive. We have a vineyard now. He accepts me and his banner over me is love. Justified believers. Let's look at a text, Romans 5, verse 1. Justified believers. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I just love this text. We could read the last verses of the previous chapter too with it. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Let's read 24 and 25 just above this ch chapter 5. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that those are some of the most powerful texts in all the Bible. And, and sometimes we get sidetracked by all the do's and don'ts. Are the do's and don'ts important? Indeed they are. They're the fruit of giving ourselves to Jesus. And, and, uh, and the new creature has new inclinations now. New ideas. New Horizons now. I want to keep the vineyard like it is mine. Where is that vineyard anyway that you have? The newborn Christian, all, all of us have a vineyard. Where is that vineyard? It's all around us. Everywhere around us. And uh, <clears throat> I want to keep the vineyard like it was, like it was mine. I'm his son and daughter. I'd like to ask you this morning, would you commit your lives to God in an atmosphere of praise? Because we are in a new atmosphere now. When you get up in the morning, you don't kiss your marriage license, right? But the, you kiss the one you love. Is that true? You're, you, you, you're, you live your life in the relationship to the person of, personhood of God. Not being ashamed of ourselves, but realizing that in Christ, I am of great worth. Live your life as if you're accepted by God, because you are. Give yourself to him in the morning. It costs Jesus a whole lot to get it for you. That's the motivation for the Christian now. And the good things that we know we should do or shouldn't do spring from that heart of love that we have for Jesus and what he's done for us. That's the only way to a victorious Christian life. We can do and do and cock-a-doodle-do. And I'll tell you what, we won't get any higher the next day before, the, next, the day after. And when we realize the cost, we have thankful hearts. It will cause the heart to sing and the feet to dance. <laughs> like, like poor old David there in, the, in, the, in front of the ark. He was so happy to see the ark brought home. We'll come to the place where we'd rather die than dishonor him. And in the judgment of the living, which is soon to pass, soon to come. In the judgment of the living, he will create the finishing touch by granting a final atonement, blotting out our sins, causing the latter rain to fall. And the final warning, warning message taken to the world, then the vineyard will be completely complete. The sealing, sealing us forever. I'd like to have a turn to Second Timothy two verse nineteen. Second, I'm getting, I'm winding down here. Second Timothy chapter two verse nineteen. Second Timothy is this is a very powerful text. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Anybody believe that here? 
Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That'll happen. We won't have to worry about that. Yeah, does it take human effort? It takes human effort. We have to think about Jesus, right? Spend some time in the book every day to learn to know him and you'll love him and you won't want to cross him up. <clears throat> Pray for the sealing Holy Spirit. How many are sealed here this morning? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, there's an end time seal coming, too. And we all, think, I think, know about that. But being sealed by the Holy Spirit is the preparation for the end time seal, where Jesus does the finishing work for us in the most holy place of heaven. You'll love God and those around you. You'll re realize you have no earthly answers. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Jesus said, love your enemies. If that uh, takes place, we won't have any enemies, right? Some people may not like us very well, but if you love your enemies, you don't have any enemies, right? You see them as God sees them. How does God see your enemies? <laughs> if you have some or think you have some. <coughs> we need to put Jesus glasses on and see people as God sees them. He sees them as, as uh, possibilities for his kingdom. Our enemies are principalities and powers in heavenly places. Demons who seek to destroy. But God provides for that too. We must ponder these things. It's possible to come across nice atheists. I want to say this so that we all hear it. It is possible to come across nice atheists. I have know some of these people. It's possible to come across, and it's also possible to come across grouchy church members. Is that possible? Nice atheists and grouchy church members, that doesn't even work, does it? Maybe at times we need a better definition of Christian. We're not accepted by God on the basis of our performance, but rather by our experience with Jesus every day. Our great Solomon, Jesus Christ, has a bride that he wants to get ready because he's going to come and receive her. There's a big marriage supper that's going to take place one of these days in the New Jerusalem. So uh, he's given us a vineyard. It's uh, really our vineyard. God holds us before, before us the reality even before it happens, like Abraham. He said, I have made you the father of many nations before Isaac was even born. Yes, he has made us the owner of a vineyard. His work becomes our work now. Inheritance is a, is a real thing in the Bible. I'd like to, in closing here, have us look at a, several texts. One of them is in Psalms. That's easy to find. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Talking about the believer in Jesus. For he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. And chapter 2, verse 8, Psalms, chapter 2, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will, give you the, I will give you the heathen for what? 
Your inheritance. Talk about inheritance. Would you like to have somebody come up to you on the sea of glass and say, you know, I'm here today. I'm so happy today. I'm praiseful today. Because why? You introduced me to Jesus. I will give you the heathen for my inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. And then that classic in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 about inheritances. I can't wrap my tongue around this one. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. It says, are we all there? Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. And if children, then what does it say next? Heirs. Heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If it be so, we suffer with him that we also may be glorified together. Lord, give us the vista before we die. I'll tell you what, when the work is finished in Sierra Vista, it'll be finished in all the earth. God has a way of making things happen at the same time. Not more surely is there a place prepared for us in the heavenly sanctuary in heaven than there is a place here on earth where we can work for God. Paul is talking to the Greek philosophers in Athens, and they're beginning to get tired of his message. They put their fingers in their ears, and we don't want to hear any more from this fellow. But what do you know what he tells them? He says, you are God's offspring. <laughs> are you God's offspring? Yes. Yeah, we're all his offspring. His vineyard is our vineyard. Soon we're going to have evangelism here. Let's enter in with joyful and thankful hearts that God has chosen us to work in this vineyard, which is in reality our vineyard, because it's his vineyard. It would be such a wonderful thing if as many people as in this room today from, our, from this group were to show up on Friday evening, January 6th, at 7 p.m. And we have an overflow. Maybe we can put chairs down the aisles and around here. This would be so wonderful. And uh, the Lord wants us to all be, have a part in this. We can all have a part in this. Pray for the spirit of evangelism to develop in our hearts. May the love of God penetrate every the very, our very being is the Holy Spirit plants love in our hearts for those around us. Soon and very soon, we're going to go and what? See the king. Soon and very soon, we're going to go and see the king. Let's sing of the risen Savior who has spared, who has shared every good thing with us and very alive and soon he will come. Our dear Father, we want to thank you for this vineyard that you've given to us. You've put it into our hands, and we want it to prosper for you. And so I pray that you will be with each person that's here today. Convict our hearts, Lord, of the time in which we live, that there isn't much time, and yet there's a world that still waits to hear the good news of salvation. So please be with each one today, each one to, according to our several needs. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you will give us what we need, all of the equipment we need and the tools we need to uh, do your work in this vineyard and that we might have a desire, Lord, to be a part of this evangelism that's upcoming. This is your vineyard, Lord. And I pray that you will bless it abundantly. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.